Good morning, everyone. Good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are, and welcome to this week's Weekly Energy Boost. My name is Ali Sheva, and I'm here this lovely Monday morning with David, and we are excited to share with you the unique opportunity of this week, which is not only a combination of what we've found by looking through the wisdom of the Zohar as it relates to this week's energy, but also the fact that we are in the sixth week of the Omer, which has its own unique opportunities. And of course, we've been sharing these last few weeks about what that means, what the challenges and what the advantages are of this time period. As we do every week on the Weekly Energy Boost, we try to provide our listeners with the most powerful and practical tools to navigate the coming seven days, inevitably through the unpacking of the those principles, those concepts, those tools, we end up sharing ideas and practices that can serve you any day of the week, any week of the year, any year of your life. So this week, we're really focusing on how to ensure that our energy, how our words, how our actions can have the maximum input, or sorry, not input, okay, also input, but I meant impact, and to use those moments that are seemingly insignificant the moments of mindlessness, the moments of nobody's looking so it doesn't really matter to really bring those moments back into what matters and to be conscious and mindful in every moment so it, so as to really give all of us the best possible potential, the best chances for living our purpose and living it sounds so cliche, but I'm going to say it anyway, living our best life. So that's really what we want to talk about this morning. Yeah. I love that. This is also the week of the Omer that is corresponding to the sixth week, which corresponds to Yesod. That's the Kabbalistic terminology, Yesod. There's a lot of energy in just saying that name. That's why I said it. And uh, Yesod represents the, bri the, the bridge between the upper and lower world. It represents... Uh, the financial well-being of a person. It represents your love life. It represents your children. It rep And when I say it represents, it represents the gate where energy flows to all those things. Which is also our mouth, our words, <coughs> how we speak. That's right. Elisha was actually, without knowing, taking it even deeper. Without We're, knowing. Without, without knowing. <laughs> she's just a channel. So if she's not really aware of what she's saying 95% of the time. So what she's actually saying is that in the same way that, for example, our entire body represents 10 dimensions of light, starting from the top, the crown, it's called the keter, all the way down to the feet, the sexual organ represents yesod. It's the way light flows out to the world. And from the point of view of the head itself, if I took just the head, the head has its own 10 dimensions, where the mouth and uh, aspects of the mouth, so to speak, represent Yesod as well, because that's how we communicate energy with the world, and that's also how we eat food, which uh, sustains our life. So the sexual organ creates life, and the mouth sustains our life. So it's all about life. It's all about the flow of life. This week is about the flow of life. Now, Yesod also represents a concept called the foundation. It means a foundation. It says that when a person has overcome his or her addictions, his or her uh, fears, that which is controlling you, you are able to control, you are able to decide what you want to eat. Your body is not telling you what you should eat. You're able to decide who you want to spend time with, who you want to talk to, what kind of a career you want to have. You make that decision. It's not society deciding that for you. Uh, you decide how you feel. And it's not other people making you feel a certain way. You have reached and corrected the level of your soul. Which the righteous, the person who is, uh, is called, isn't it? we say he's a Sadiq, the person who is able to control every aspect of their feelings, emotions, fears, addictions, so on and so forth. So, where am I getting at? The foundation. What is your found? What is your foundation for how you receive pleasure? And this is on the heels of what Ali Shavu just said, which is, if it, all of us have a system that we've designed for ourselves that defines whether we are happy or not. 
It's an, it's an interest. It's a deep. It's a deep concept, and I'm asking a deep question. What is your system by which you are happy or not happy? And you'd be surprised because we don't really ask that question to ourselves much. And you'll realize that some people, their system of happiness is is only if people like them, they're happy. And if people don't like them, they're not happy. Okay, so, and it could be that a thousand people like you, but then one person looks at you funny and you're miserable. That means your system for happiness revolves around what people think about you. Another system, another construct is there are people who are only happy when they're busy. Um, and when they're not busy, wh whether they accomplish or not, doesn't even matter. They just have to be busy. And then they feel, they feel like they're accomplishing something. They feel like they're, they're valuable. They feel like they're doing something. Are you a person that feels good only when you're busy? Meaning if I took you aside and I asked you to meditate for three hours, you would want to jump off a cliff because that is not pleasurable because you're not busy in your mind. There are people who only feel happy when they're accomplishing something, when they achieve something, when they overcome something. So they're constantly beating themselves up, perfectionists, tweaking this, tweaking that, making comments, trying to tweak their spouse, tweak their girlfriend, tweak their boyfriend, say this, say that, improve, 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 because they get, they're addicted. Their pleasure construct is, if today is a little more improved than yesterday, then I feel good. That's my foundation. So we all have these illusionary foundations. And what's powerful about what Yeshiva said is the chaos always comes and starts to poke at the foundations that are, that, are, that are weak, that are not meant to be, that are not of the light of the Creator. We can talk about what foundation we need to have, but let's talk about the foundations that are what we should not have. Whoa. Okay. What do you think about what do you think about that? What is our audience saying about that? Well, I think when it's it's in it's essential in order to examine our foundations that we recognize the external is simply there to get us to a certain place internally. Mm -hmm. If we could assess our personal expense report when it comes to energy, mm -hmm. right, which to me is a big part of examining your foundation. P your PNL. PNL of energy. energy. Mm -hmm. What do I spend most of my energy on? Where are, you know, those ads that you see where they're asking you, how many subscriptions do you have? Download this app and we'll cancel the subscriptions you don't use. Oh, yeah, I saw that. Okay. I've seen that ad everywhere. If you think about it, how many, or it's not even a question, we all have subscriptions to false sources of energy or false <laughs> takers of energy that are sort of on autopilot like that. Mm. monthly downloads, monthly subscriptions, <laughs> monthly deposits and monthly withdrawals that we're not even paying attention to, mm. right? And we always get into the, you know, the rabbit hole that the s social media can be, that's one thing, but it's even, you know, I, I know a few people that are coming close to, example, for example, coming close to retirement. And if they're honest with themselves, they're already living there living in the reality that doesn't exist yet, that false construct of this is how it's gonna be next year or in five years or in 10 years. And the, the challenge with that, and we're not talking about sitting down with a financial planner and figuring out the, the life you wanna live for the next 50 years. We're talking about having something in front of you and checking out from it and being in a reality that doesn't exist literally drains the energy from the reality you're in and the reality you think you're creating in your mind. So that to me is an example of an energetic subscription that you don't even realize you're diminishing your own ability, your own potential, your own strength, your own effectiveness because you have those, 
dribbles, <laughs> I'm going to call it. Your energy is slowly dribbling out without you even realizing it. Sometimes it's a group chat, by the way. Drama in the group chat. We haven't talked about this in the, about a year or so. Yeah. You might be a part of, it might be for work, right? It might just be your family chat. It might be a, a mom chat or a knitting chat or a golf <laughs> chat or, you know, those kind of things where people are constantly posting stuff. And as you're checking it, you know, you, you don't, you don't want to leave because you don't want to offend anybody. So you check in every now and again. That's another example of how the energy dribbles out of your cup. So for me, examining the foundation is almost like saying, what do I have to work with? And if I don't have enough energy, enough structure, enough discipline, enough even motivation for my, at my foundation, that's the beginning, that's where the work is for me, for me personally, or if you know, I was talking to you one-on-one -on -one and helping you strategize this, it's really to do a P&L of your energy. Mm. And once you recognize where the, the, le the slow leaks are, where the, maybe there's a fast leak that yeah. is so subtle that you're not even realizing it, or maybe you're getting energy also from false sources. When I say false, that doesn't mean you don't feel the energy, it just means the energy is not gonna last. So this is also a very powerful week to examine what are my policies and procedures <laughs> when it comes to managing my energy, managing my resources, and then implementing a new structure, a new strategy, new discipline, so that you have greater resources to work from. Well, as it reminded me of something funny when somebody told me, you know, ca especially when things aren't going well, that cash is king. And I said, no, cash flow is king. <laughs> what, is, what does that mean? That means, are you paying attention to what's going in and ver versus what's going out? And I think, I was just thinking about this yesterday. You know, you know how with the, we have these, uh, the iPhone has a service now, I guess, that that can disable your, your text messaging, your, call, your calling while you're driving, so you can focus on the driving. Which obviously, it's a great feature. Um, that was not a paid promotion. No. And, and I'm sure many of us, if you're like me, you, you, you used it and then you still used your phone and said, but aren't you, the, the phone says, aren't you driving? No, I'm not driving. Um, so that you can just do your text. But that's bad. I shouldn't have said that. But that's just, I'm just trying to relate to, to the audience. But I was thinking there should be an, a service that disconnects all social media like after 5 p.m. So that... It literally block, it locks you out of every social media account after 5 p.m. So even if you try to do it, you cannot access it. And then it reopens it up like at 9 a.m. or something the next day. I, I, I know people that. that delete social media apps for periods during the week. I'm talking, yeah, well, I, that, that sounds laborious. I'm thinking just something that automatically shuts it off. There's no way you can access it. That, that, I, I'm sure there's something out there like that if our audience can comment. And if not, that. David gets a cut of whatever right. you make yep. on this app. Yep, 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 yep. So, so I think that goes back to well, what kind of a life can I live that is avoiding all of those things that are just taking the energy? And there's this concept Kabbalistically that m when a person has more, more means I'm, I'm connecting to the negative side. More equals negativity. And uh, while, while having it all represents the light, okay? More represents negativity. Having all represents the light. And it's a deeper concept, but the idea is the more that you bring, the more you try to do, the more you try to bring in, the more things you buy, the more projects you work on, you actually start to lose your energy to all of those things. The more you receive in your life, you lose energy because everything takes energy. Every, every little thing is taking energy from our lives. And we think that happiness and pleasure will come from when I have more. But in reality, it's the simplification. And I'm not saying have less. It's the simplification of your life. All of us should be striving to have greatness simplification and focus are you simplifying your life 
while elevating it or are you complicating your life while trying to elevate it? Because the complication is what will suck the energy. So even if you achieve great things, when you have a, a complicated system at that high level, you will lose the energy. It would dribble out, as Elisheva said. And this is, goes back to, uh, to a show that, we, that I think it was last week. We talked about the idea of simplicity of going back to the basics. Always the basics. We should talk about it all the time. The basics of spirituality is how you should approach your life. The pause, the embracing of the process, having certainty. Don't overthink it. Don't have a movie in your head. Don't start shouting at people in your head. Don't start thinking about what if this happens, what if that happens. And it's hard because there's a muscle we have that reacts from fear to try to plan everything out and control situations and control other people. And finding that perfect balance of, of yes, I need to be present, I need to make choices, but I want that the creator is a partner in my life, channeling and flowing through me, helping me and guiding me. Because there, there is, if a person gets out of the way, the creator will guide them to the optimal path. It's not that we have to do anything. We have to stop doing, we have to stop controlling and, and manipulating and injecting ourselves. So the work is how do I pull myself out? When I overcome an addiction, I'm pulling myself out of the process. When I'm overcoming a fear by doing something or not doing something, I'm taking myself out of the process so that the creator can guide and lead me. Too often, we're all trying to lead ourselves. We're trying to plan things. We're trying to manifest a relationship. We're trying to manifest a certain situation in life. And, and you'll see that as you try and try, you'll get drained and you'll fail. And, it'll, you'll, and, and then you'll step back and be like, oh, you know what? I really don't know what I'm doing. And actually, that broken ego is when the light comes in. So, so how do we achieve this state of I don't know what I'm doing but I, I need that the creator will guide me and lead me. This is the consciousness. This is the foundation we need. All these other energies and pleasures are just distracting us, distracting us, these constructs we've created for ourselves. I'm only happy if X, Y, and Z. I'm only happy if X, Y, and Z. It's all a draining foundation. It's so interesting what David was speaking about because I think one of the things I try to do as I'm listening to you is balance the abstract and the specific, the the general and the specific or the big picture and the small details. Mm. And as I'm listening to you, I'm thinking about for, for people like me, not only myself, but for people like me, it's easy to get lost in the to-do list, mm. in the tasks. Uh, if you're like me, your feet hit the, the floor in the morning and sometimes you don't even sit for many hours sometimes till the kids are in bed or everything is closed or we, we tend to let our lives run us and not run our lives to your point. So for me, it really helps when I get mired in the to-do lists, in the tasks, in the shopping lists, in the reminding myself to go to sit and answer my email, you know, my email box is full. I've got to answer so many emails. It's very easy to, get so bogged down by what you need to do that you forget to be. And especially, maybe that sounds a bit cliche, but what I'm really saying is if you can reconnect those mundane moments to being a building block of greater fulfillment, build a building block of greater wisdom, greater certainty, greater clarity. Yeah, I, I have to buy, go to the grocery store. Is there anything, David, David goes to the grocery store for pleasure. I go to the grocery oh, store because, that, right? yes. You. Sometimes you'll see me meandering through the aisles of the grocery store because it's very calming. Relaxing. Okay, so I so the go to the market because I have to, okay? Because if not, children go hungry in your neighborhood, okay? <laughs> so to me... And I, this, is, this is really me being honest. I look at the work that we do, David, as very holy, as very elevated. I really, I try to give 120% of myself, be fully present to inject consciousness, 
to draw assistance from the creator, to use it as a spiritual tool. But it's really hard to do that in the supermarket. Mm -hmm. It's really hard to do. I, you know what? I got to wash my car. That's a great example. I need to wash my car. That is literally, it just gets bumped from today's to-do list to tomorrow's to-do list. To, I, it's, I cannot justify the time suck mm. on washing my car. Now, the Kabbalists come and say, but Elisheva, it's your job, your purpose. You are part of creating the revelation of the light force in the world, including at the car wash. David and I sitting here sharing powerful wisdom and tools to thousands of people on a Monday morning, to me, that reveals infinite light, mm. right? Because I don't know who's gonna receive the wisdom, I don't know who's gonna use the wisdom, I don't know who's gonna share what we said. It's, it's literally infinite, the impact that I can have in these 30 minutes. Mm. And I inject that consciousness and I visualize the light, the world lighting up as a result of these 30 something minutes. <laughs> I can't see that at the car wash. I can't see that at the supermarket. I might be able to see it at Starbucks because I see how Starbucks, this is not a paid promotion, can be an integral part of me being more impactful, more focused, more, of course I'm kidding and I'm not, but th the important thing to remember, I think, in those moments, and this is, this is coming from a recovering waste of time hater. I, I used to have very low tolerance for waste of time David maybe can relate to this more than what I was saying before, <laughs> that, you know, I get to the bottom, bottom line me, cut to the chase. I was always like, okay, what do you need? Just tell me what you need. Don't that's tell how, me the that's story. That's always how you were, you're saying. Right. Mm -hmm. And then I realized that hearing the story, getting through the, learning the evolution that brought us here today, understanding the process and the procedure and the history is also a way for me to reveal light. It's my job to bring light to the mundane, to the minutia, to the tedious, to the unspiritual. And when I learned that, everything changed. That, okay, I still am not excited to go to get my car washed. <laughs> but I learned to take those moments where I seem to be wasting my time. I'm not doing something spiritual. I'm not doing something elevated. I'm not doing something that's going to help the world. I realized that I can help the world by deciding that whatever I'm doing at the car wash is going to reveal light. And that actually talks, speaks to the concept we talked about last week, that we really get to decide if something is good or bad. In that same sense, we get to decide if this reveals light, if this is powerful, if this is impactful. And the more we look at things and situations as wastes of time or wastes of energy, we determine that they're wastes of time and wastes of energy. And this to me, as we've been talking these last few weeks about the different illusions that this time called the Omer can present us with, is a huge one. Mm -hmm. If you think sitting, and maybe this is, this is a shout out to the former me 20 years ago, mm -hmm. sitting on the couch with your kids and watching TV, not a waste of time. If you decide it's quality time and you're gonna be present and you're gonna talk to your kids about what you're watching and you're gonna laugh with them and create inside jokes with them and all those things, it's not a waste of time. But if you sit on the couch, checked out, checking social media while you could be spending time with your family, you are declaring it a waste of time. Mm. So when we talk about creating a foundation, we have to understand that it's actually our consciousness that first and foremost lays that foundation for whatever we want to build on it. Whatever you, this is a recurring theme, whatever you decide it is, that's what it is. And that can be tremendously overwhelming and depressing because if you have a pessimistic outlook, if you tend to see the glass half empty, if you tend to judge everybody and not give them the benefit of the doubt, you are basically limiting everything and everyone in your life. It can also be very inspiring and empowering to know that if you can shift the way you think about it, if you can inject that consciousness, that you're revealing light even as you're changing that flat tire or fixing that scuff on your shoe or organizing a bookshelf, you will organize the, the most light-filled bookshelf on the planet if you decide that's what you're doing. What I love about what you said, it's something I've been thinking about a lot this week and you know we can wrap up with this. It's 
it's just in, and we talk about all these deep concepts and changing and transforming it. At the end of the day, I know something I personally am emphasizing more on is just staying in this positive mindset and 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 stop judging where we are at all the time, right? If I'm if I'm sitting doing nothing, or I'm sitting waiting, or if I even if I'm wasting my time on whatever platform or app. We, we, we judge ourselves that what we're doing is bad or good. We start labeling stuff. At the end of the day, if you are of the vibration in your consciousness that's in line with the light of the creator, you're with the light. So it's kind of like even if you're eating something you shouldn't eat, as long as you're enjoying it and you're happy about it, you're actually with the light. That, 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 of course, there's the aspect of it that you ate something that's not good for you. So maybe there's a little negativity there. But why compound that negativity with being upset about it and, and complaining about it and beating yourself up about it? So now you have four negative energies involved versus maybe just one. So you know, I think our teachers, our teachers used to always like tell us, like, if you eat the wrong food, right, just enjoy it. There's no, there's no problem with enjo- and enjoying something, choosing to enjoy something in the moment is 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 a great great consciousness it's a great consciousness and we don't allow ourselves to enjoy and that's how satan that's what satan does that's what the opponent does to us he makes sure that you're never present in whatever you're doing per what elisha has said so if it's just our words or our thoughts or just our behavior just be that positive person everywhere you go try to just share and that's something else we talk about because our audience, if you want to be with the light of the creator, it's not enough just to hear this stuff. And we, and we know this. Like The hearing of the stuff actually doesn't really do much. It's When you're an example of the light out in the world, this is the greatest form of becoming a channel of light. So you'll start to receive your own wisdom, your own concepts. The creator will speak to you in exactly the language you need. If you are inspiring others, to also be with the light of the creator. And I'm not saying you need to go out there and start dumping Kabbalah verbiage and, 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 and lingo at, at Setting people. up a, a soapbox at Hyde Park and pontificating. <laughs> pontificating, yes. And, and an SAT word. It, it, it's, I, I, know, I know you and I, like, the only time we're teaching Kabbalistic concepts or even talking about Kabbalah is like in classes. When I'm out in public with people, I'm, I'm, what I'm trying to do is represent the energy of what we're teaching, not teach the teach what we're teaching. Because you don't want to teach outside. You want to be an example of the energy, and people will learn and feel what the light of the Creator is. People have to feel what the light is, not be explained to what the light is. Um, I know I sound like a hypocrite explaining what the light is on, <laughs> on a podcast. But, but even that, I think our teachers would always tell us, even when you're teaching a class, what people are hearing and feeling is how much restriction in spirituality you're implementing in the class itself. It's not the words. And I, and, and I know, I remember talking to Eitan, who was, who, who was with us recently, and he would, he would one time, I remember, it stayed in my mind that he was going to teach a concept in class, and he wanted, this thought came to his mind to teach it. And they said, you know what, I'm going to let go. I'm going to let go of teaching this concept. For whatever reason, he let it go. And then like 10 minutes later, a student asked the question and then asked about that concept. Why, why am I sharing that? He was explaining like it, the process of even restriction should be in a classroom, of letting go should even be in the classroom. That reveals light. So if you really want to say something, you got to let go. And then it comes in a different way, whatever. And then when it comes again, it comes from the light. So everything you want to do and you're excited about doing, there has to be an element of letting go, especially during the Omer. And let the light kind of bring it to you or, or met, that it comes from the light. Um, as opposed to us just doing it right away just because it came to our brain. Anyways, let's just close it with that. I I, th- I think that that's one of the most powerful things you said <laughs> all morning is that if you're not showing up in the world in a more light-like way, and that's that's an actionable thing our listeners can do this week, is to be focused on, you can also focus on all the things we said before, building a stronger foundation, espe- expressing Uh, your words with more consciousness, behaving with more, you know, navigating your life with the goal of having more certainty. But at the end of the day, the measure of your growth is actually how you show up in the world. 
Are you showing up in the world in a more light-like way? Are you, are you acting like the light? Even in those moments on the couch with your kids or in traffic, get, trying to get somewhere or uh, shopping at the supermarket or getting your car washed, right? If th the Kabbalists call that kind of person uh, builder of the world, that if your actions of kindness, generosity, compassion, if you are a walking beacon of light, you are sustaining the world. And to me, David maybe thinks of this less, but as a, as a person who's been on a spiritual journey for a long time, I can tell you I'm much less motivated by it's the right thing to do or it's really good for me or it's going to be good for me in the long run, more light in the long run. It's much more motivating for me to think about the impact I can have on others. So when I do that restriction, when I do that letting go, I think about how it's sustaining my family, sustaining my, my work environment, sustaining my community, my city, my state, my country, the planet, humanity, and that usually pushes me over the edge to do the action that's difficult for me. To that point, we wanna make sure that everybody remembers that both David and I are beginning Kabbalah One courses in the next 10 days or so. I am starting on Wednesday, May 25th at 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific. You can go to weeklyenergyboost.com to register. It's pay what you can. So you can pay $10, you can pay $1,000, whatever you feel you're able and it is worth to you, you're invited to pay that. David's is in person that starts on Thursday, June 2nd at 7 p.m. at the Los Angeles Kabbalah Center. It's in person, which if you're able to join there, we cannot, obviously, Zoom is great for people who can't be there. Being there in person is a gift. And if you can be there, get there. You can find the links on our website, weeklyenergyboost.com. We also want to invite you to follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Weekly Energy Boost. Dot com no weekly <laughs> weekly energy boost where you can find we, we post all different kinds of supporting content and inspiration throughout the week so that you can implement this in your life and um, if you have any questions you're also welcome to email us at energyboost at kabbalah.com like rate review and share and we'll see you next week on the weekly energy boost mm -hmm.